Thanks to our friends in Temple for sharing their garden with us. Right now we're going to be talking about uh, wildflower planting and habitat planting, if you will, for uh, migrating species and for water conservation. I'm joined by Bill Neiman from Native American Seed. It's great to have you back on Central Texas Gardener. It is a very good pleasure to be back. Thank you, Tom. Well, Native American Seed is one of the primary purveyors of so many different native plant seeds here in Central Texas, not just in Central Texas, but actually probably in the nation right now. Well, the Southern Plains for sure, yeah. and actually some even to Northern Mexico. All right, so you, you are providing what I think is probably a pretty hot commodity right now. Well, I guess every time they pour another yard of concrete, the, <laughs> there are others that realize the value of what's being lost and mm -hmm. the, the need to put it back like it was. Right. Well, put it back like it was is critically important these days because these are species that are uh, habituated or are used to uh, the kind of drought experience that Texas is going through right now. Yes, uh, I, I kind of... We haven't used the word yet, but I might as well get started. It's called prairie. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> they're really uh, prairies evolved with drought. And, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a co-mingling of grass, fire, drought, and cloven-hooved animals that, mm -hmm. that made the prairie work. And uh, there are his historic records that go back that show these droughts. In fact, the times that we're in now are actually more normal. Hmm. There's some uh, research now coming to light that shows about the last 40 or 50 or 60 years was actually abnormally wet. Ah. So people like you and I who grew up thinking that that was normal are really uh, being awakened to the, to the reality that uh, this is a prairie mm -hmm. and that prairies uh, evolved with drought and perhaps what we thought was normal was actually abnormal. Right, right. And that perhaps we are in a more normal climate as far as rainfall goes. Mm -hmm. It's pretty, uh, uh, there's a lot of history that says that long extended periods of drought have been here before. All right, well that's sobering to say the least, but uh, you have a an answer for that when you talk about prairie and prairie restoration because you have been doing this work for decades now. This is our it, 25th year. And you've developed how many different kinds of seed mixes? Well, we have 30 mixtures, mm -hmm. uh, some of them as many as 52 species mm -hmm. that are uh, specific uh, to solve ecological problems. Right. And uh, many of our mixtures we, we, we feel are actually ecosystem in a bag. Mm -hmm. When you uh, saw the fires, for example, in 2011, right. we uh, developed two uh, uh, scorched earth recovery mixes. One mm -hmm. uh, for an eastern one. Uh, for Perfect the for Bastrop. Ba Bastrop right. uh, in the southeast uh, areas. And then uh, west of 35, the, mm -hmm. the scorched earth recovery mix. So... Uh, <coughs> The, these are species that are a uh, uh, wide uh, range of conditions from mm -hmm. caliche to bottomland soils. They are short uh, annual wildflowers that uh, take advantage of any kind of disturbance on the soil that will rapidly recover and revegetate the land. And also a mixture of deep rooted warm season perennials, mm -hmm. annuals, uh, perennials, warm season, and cool season. Mm -hmm. So it, this is the approach that I have found to be the most successful, and in particular uh, with the subject at hand with the, with the butterflies, right. but not only just butterflies, but all of life. It is all about a holistic approach. Right. And the understanding of the intermingling of the relationships of, of the plants to the animals and even to us, the humans. Right. Well, you you, know, you talk about the mixture of seeds and and the deep rootedness of some of these. I, I think it's striking just to talk about like one species, like Liatris, which is one of the uh, premier fall wildflowers for the state of Texas, especially in the Balcones escarpment area. Uh, they can have roots 20 feet deep. That's so <laughs> correct. These are uh, healing Survivors. plants. They are survivor <laughs> plants and they are healing plants. I have a little quick story about uh, liatris okay. that's unbelievable, but these plants will find their way. They're windborne seeds. Mm -hmm. They blow in the winds, but <laughs> they find 
a disturbed, ruined piece of land, and that's where they want to root up in some of the harshest conditions sometimes. Mm -hmm. In fact, if it's a really rich, lush, uh, moist uh, soil area, they don't do very well at all. Uh -huh. they, they, they will rot. But <clears throat> these are very long-lived, almost prehistoric-looking bulbs, if you ever dig one up. And in our farming operation, we have rows and rows and rows, but uh, as the years go by, some of them actually die out. Maybe mm -hmm. we care for them too much, or maybe they just burn out. And so, but this bulb becomes hollowed, and it's real fibrous on the inside, mm -hmm. and mice will come and burrow and make a nest in there in the wintertime <laughs> and bring seeds of native grasses into that Interesting. nest. Interesting. To recall, that mm -hmm. is how I'm talking about where it's you would look at the system as a holistic approach. Oh, that's beautiful. And now, this is the time of year for a lot of folks here in Central Texas to be thinking about seeding. So, uh, again, you've got mixes for just about every different kind of situation sun, shade, east I 35, and deep clay soils, or in the caliche, all those different things are there. Um, what what do you recommend to people in terms of prepping their sites? Well, the seeds have to touch the earth. Mm -hmm. And so you can't just cast them out there on top of a bunch of dried straw or leaves mm -hmm. material and or if the soil is really heavily crusted over or compact, the mm -hmm. seeds will just lay on top and then the first wind or rain will just blow mm -hmm. them away. So uh, the soil uh, crust needs to be uh, made somewhat friable and the seeds need to be able to touch that earth. Mm -hmm. And the rule of thumb is to plant the seed two times the diameter of the seed is how deep you would plant it. Okay. So you take like a lemon mint seed mm -hmm. that is the diameter of this 0 0.5 millimeter pencil lead <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> and you put it two times that deep. Okay. All right. So in other uh, words, uh, on the surface, and then just press it down. Okay, got you. Now, uh, one of the reasons why we're talking today and encouraging people to take this approach is because uh, these species, these habitats that you create, are so beneficial to migratory species, including the butterflies, and uh, they provide not just food but cover and lots of other things, right? Yes. Yeah. Sometimes I, I. Uh... I get a little bit, uh, I guess, uh, where I want to say that if a person can only focus on a blooming flower and a butterfly landing on it, they're missing the point. Mm -hmm. That That is a moment in time. Mm -hmm. But the butterfly is alive and the plant is alive. And both of them are changing and their needs are various and great. Mm -hmm. So the butterfly needs a place to hide to sleep, it needs food, it needs a place for nesting or for to raise its young. Mm -hmm. And when the young hatch, they need a certain kind of protection and food. So this is where if you can think in terms of, of rebuilding a habitat mm -hmm. instead of planting a specific species, right. but in, in, instead build a colony or a like a little pocket prairie right. that could uh, provide a lot of needs for the various species. All right. Well, I, I love that bigger picture that you're you're trying to get people to focus on because it, it, it's the, the butterfly and the plants are interdependent in many different ways. And one of the cool things that I've noted in in, in your products now is that you have these specific blends of things. Like there's a sustain the migration kit specifically for butterflies and uh, for monarchs, and then you have a butterfly retreat mix. Now, how would those two be different? Well, let's take the Sustained Migration Kit, and it is a, a blend of three different individual milkweeds, and that is for the person that is just really focused on a monarch. I got you. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that little kit contains what is required to do a cold stratification. There's actually vermiculite and instructions, ah. and some some uh, neo, uh, neoprene rubber gloves mm. so that you can go through the whole motion and cold stratify those seeds. Okay. And uh, now let's talk a brief second about that. For the fall planting, mm -hmm. that you could put these seeds out without going through all those motions and let the wintertime cold stratify them, okay. and they would sprout next spring. Okay. And the and butterfly retreat is numerous species, uh, perennials and annuals, that provide all of those various sustenance that mm -hmm. I mentioned. Okay, and things like the frostweed, gay feather, and all Maximilian those other things. Sunflower, all these beautiful species. Yes. 
Well, the, the, it's just terrific work that you're doing, and I know that uh, you have created a place out there where people can come and visit as well at Native American Seeds. You're located in, in Junction, Texas. That's correct. And people can also find uh, you online, and your catalog, I have to say, is an amazing resource. Well, thank you. Uh, we produce two of those per year. This is our 25th year, so our 50th production is underway right now All in right. this catalog. All right. Well, Bill, it's a real pleasure to be with you, and thank you for the work that you're doing for all thank of us. Thank you for and, spreading the word. And uh, coming up next is our friend Daphne.